darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory hey Everyone, welcome to Prairie Creek Church um, If your week was like mine, just crazy crazy um and sometimes it's hard to roll in here on sunday morning and just change gears and flip the switch and 
and shift our focus to Jesus. So that's the challenge, right? You know, Jesus reminded us and Paul reminded us over and over again to fix our eyes on Jesus, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Um, as long as we keep our eyes on him and don't get, get focused on the wind and the waves and get distracted and derailed by the challenging circumstances of our lives, uh, we will walk by faith and not by sight. But that's the challenge, right? I mean, we're just constantly taking our eyes off of, off of God and putting them on ourselves and on our stuff, and then we feel like we're sinking. So why don't we do that for a moment here? Why don't we fix our eyes on Jesus? Why don't we lay aside the, the baggage and the stuff and the cares of our life that we rolled in here with, and let's give him our undivided attention and devotion this morning. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we are grateful that you are the Lord of the universe and you are the Lord of our lives and that you offer hope and that you offer peace that passes all understanding, that you offer comfort and, and wisdom and grace and strength for the moment, for the day, um, because we need it. You know, we are sojourners. We are exiles in a hostile world uh, and we need your help. And we need your guidance, and we need your direction, and we need your comfort and strength and peace to make it through our day and to remind us of what is true and to help us to keep the main thing the main thing. Lord, you said last week as we went through the Sermon on the Mount that you said to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and then all these other things will be taken care of. You'll, you, you know what our needs are. You care for us like a, like a good, good father. And so, Lord, help us to keep first things first. Help us to seek your kingdom first. And so I pray that we would right now make this emotional and relational and mental and spiritual shift in our lives to come to you and to offer you uh, our mess and to say we don't have really much to offer you, but we need you and we need your grace and strength today. So we come to you and we tell you that we love you, that we're here to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're here to um, hear what you want to say to us. So give us ears to hear um, and help us to be listeners today. And not just listeners, but doers to listen and respond to what you're saying by your word and by your spirit. So we give you this service. We give you our songs of praise. We open our mouth in praise and thanksgiving for who you are and for what you've done. Uh, especially for Jesus and for salvation and forgiveness. Thank you that you're redeeming and making us new. And so do a work in our lives and help us to leave this place changed, transformed with our eyes fixed on you. We give you all the glory and all the praise for what is going to go on here today. May we meet with you in a real and meaningful way today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand up and sing Holy is the Lord. Holy is 
Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Oh, yes, Lord. Uh, those words could not be more true, God, that I am chosen and not forsaken, and I am accepted by you, and you are not against us. And so, God, I pray that everyone here would realize that, that, God, you love us unconditionally, that um you would go to the ends of the earth and beyond that for us. And so all we have to do is make the decision to turn towards you and focus straight on you. So God, I pray that today could just be a day where we lift you on high, give you the praise that you deserve, and um, just be able to lay the other things aside and focus solely on you. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad that you all are here today. Um, I was just telling Amy last night, uh, laying in bed and thinking about the service this morning and, and uh, couldn't sleep and just was praying for you, praying that God would meet with us and speak to us this morning. And I just said, you know, I just feel like God's really doing something and like this is what we're doing here is really important. I hope you realize that this isn't just casually attending religious services, right? Just playing church and checking, on your, checking off your religion box for the, for the week or the month or the six months, whatever that may be. Um, that There's something really incredible and supernatural actually happening here. And um, we were just singing about that our God is Father, that He has chosen us, that He's adopted us, that He's brought us into His family. We belong to Him. We're His children and all the incredible changes and transformation that comes along with that. We have a new identity. We have a new purpose. We have a new mission in life. We have a different significance. Our identity is not found in the stuff of this life like we were talking about last week. It's found in who we are in Him. And so we get to be children of the King, and that changes everything. And so what we're doing here and what we're doing as we go about our daily lives is no longer living for ourselves, but we're living for the one who... Uh, invited us into his family who sent his son to die on the cross for us and calls us to a higher calling, a greater mission, a greater story. We get to play a role in that bigger story of what God is doing in the world. So that's amazing, amazing. All right, so that was free. This is, uh, this is the time for the children's message. Um, and so every, you know, if you looked around, if you're new, by the way, a lot of new faces today. Welcome, glad you're here. Um, you look around and you see we got a lot of kids here, which is really exciting. Because one of the things that we take very seriously here at Prairie Creek Church is intentionally passing on our faith to the next generation. Um, um, we say it this way, either we or this world is, is discipling our children. It, it's, it's training up our children. So uh, we want to take seriously our responsibility to train up our children to know and love and follow God with their lives, as opposed to what the world is trying to teach our children, the values that they're teaching, uh, the life skills that they're teaching, and they, what, you know, uh, the worldview that they're passing on. So we take this really, really seriously. All it takes is for this generation of believers to drop the ball in passing the baton of faith to the next generation, and then we've got a whole generation of people that don't know God. Uh, so we're really serious about uh, discipling, and discipleship starts in our homes, moms and dads. This, you know, we're not uh, primarily responsible. Prairie Creek Church isn't primarily responsible for discipling your children. Moms and dads, you are. Uh, the mandate is for moms and dads to love the Lord your God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to teach, them, di teach these things diligently to their children. When you get up in the morning, when you lie down at night, and all throughout your day, you're supposed to be pointing them to the one who made them and loves them and has a incredible plan for their life. And so uh, we want to come alongside you as parents and 
be intentional about teaching uh, all of the children here about who God is. And so we're going through the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is not some disconnected collection of 66 books that have nothing to do with each other, and somebody uh, cobbled them together and bound them together and called this the Bible. Um, it's actually the story of God. Okay? We tend to, sometimes we tend to think of the Bible as an ancient history book or maybe a, a spiritual self-help book. Um, certainly it does teach history, and certainly it does give us some spiritual guidance, but primarily the Bible is a book about God, who God is, and how God has acted in this world that he's made, and the purposes for which he made it, the purposes for which he made us, that helps us to make better sense of the world we live in, make better sense of who we are, who God is, how we're to relate to one another, and what we're supposed to be living for in this, this world. So that makes, uh, that is the whole purpose of why we tell the story of the Bible, so that we can begin to connect the dots and see how it's one seamless overarching story, God's story, of his work in the world. So we're kind of started through creation, and now we're to the kings of Israel. And today we're talking about one of Israel's greatest kings and greatest warriors, King David. Now we tend to think of David as a great warrior. David and Goliath, he killed the giant Goliath, and, and uh, he was a, a great military leader, and he became a great king, and uh, all of this. But sometimes what, what gets obscured is that David was also a great musician. Anybody know what, uh, what instrument David played? Anyone? Anyone? What do you got, Connor? Harp. Played the harp. Yeah, played the harp. In fact, he was such a skilled harp player that word got around in Israel that he was, and that was when he was a teenager, that he was really skilled with the harp. So the king, King Saul, invited him to come into his court and play the harp to be his harpist. So David harped on Saul, right? No, sorry about that. Anyway. He came and played his harp to calm Saul down. And, but, but not only that, he wasn't just a skilled musician, but he wrote a lot of the songs that he sang. Does anybody, does anybody know what, what uh, the, the songs that David wrote are called? What are they called in the Bible? Lizzie? Psalms. That's not psalms. Uh, P-S-A-L-M-S. Psalms, okay? They're, they're basically songs. Um, many of them David wrote. Others were written by other musicians in David's court, Asaph and, and, and others. Um, but David was an was a incredible musician and an incredible songwriter, and he never lost that love for music and that love for singing and that love for playing the harp. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Bible said that the Holy Spirit would come on David uh, and he would write uh, some of these songs, which later became... Uh, part of the Psalms, of the book of Psalms. Um, and they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They became part of Scripture. And he wrote many different kinds of Psalms. Uh, he wrote, of course, Psalms of praise. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Better is one day in his house than a thousand days elsewhere. We've, we've, we recognize these because we sing a lot of David's songs today, don't we? Um, he would, he would write psalms of praise, thanking God for his goodness, for his protection, for his provision, for all of his many blessings. Uh, they were songs of praise and thanksgiving. And then he also wrote psalms when he was sad. And, and these were called, does anybody know what, the psalms, what some of the sad psalms are called? They're called psalms of, does any, this is a real tough one. Mia, big kid. Lament. Psalms of lament. Lament means you're sad. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you find yourself in circumstances that you're not happy about, and you're crying out to God. He, David's crying out to God, where are you when I need you? I'm in trouble. I, I, I laid awake all night wetting my pillow with tears, stuff like that, right? Um, uh, or he was afraid and said, you know, I'm surrounded by my enemies, and I'm about to die, and if you don't intervene in a miraculous way, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be killed, and how can I praise you from the grave? So I need you to deliver me. Uh, he was discouraged many times. Uh, he had parenting issues with some of his sons who went, uh, rebelled, and, and um, he had a lot of challenges, and he would write about these things and turn them into songs. Uh, one psalm is a famous one, Psalm 42, where he says, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. I am so dry and parched and thirsty, God. I need you to show up. I need to quench my thirst on you. And, and then he goes on to say in that same Psalm 42, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? He talks about, he, he makes a list of all the things that are wrong in his life, and it was a long list. 
It's kind of dark. And David said, I love, but we love this about David, right? He's really just gut level, genuine, honest, straight up with God. He doesn't mince any words. He doesn't smooth over things like, ever since you've come into my life, God, everything's easy and safe and smooth and my life is going great. I'm always happy. No, he just said, this is hard. I'm really sad. I'm really depressed. Why are you so downcast on oh, my soul? But, but, but he says, I will put my hope in God. He kept turning his focus back to God. When he looked at all the things wrong in his life, he says, I've got to put my focus back on you. You are my help. You are my fortress. You are my refuge. You are my strong tower. Then even when life went hard for him because of his own sinful choices, he wrote that into a psalm. Who would do that, by the way? Who would write into scripture to be immortalized for all time the worst thing that you'd ever done? Psalm 51 was David crying out to God for forgiveness for his, his sin, his adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, he had uh, lusted after Bathsheba uh, and committed adultery with her, tried to cover it up, killed her husband to cover it up, and it went south for him really bad. And, and he, when, it came to his, when he came to his senses and came to the realization that what he had done was devastatingly sinful and wrong and that he'd sinned against God and he'd sinned against Uriah and sinned against Bathsheba and had sinned against all the people in his kingdom over, over whom he was king, he cried out to God, God, you know, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And he cried out to God in this psalm of forgiveness. So, and then other psalms he wrote asking for God's deliverance and rescue. So, and then even one psalm he wrote, uh, well, more than one psalm he wrote about, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a coming king, a future king that would once and for all deliver Israel and would redeem Israel and be the savior. Of course, who was that talking about? This is Psalm 22, by the way, and he listened, listened to part of what he said. This is literally... Uh, more than a thousand years before Jesus came, he wrote this, they've pierced my hands and my feet. This is Psalm 22. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothes they cast lots. What was he talking about there? What was that a prophecy of? Who did they pierce and who did they divide up his clothes and cast lots for his clothes, Lance? Jesus, right? Always the right answer. Good job. Jesus, yes. He was writing about the future coming king, the Messiah, the Savior, who would come and deliver them all, right? And then, of course, does anybody remember David's most famous psalm? How did we forget this one? The, the most famous psalm of all, what is it? Psalm 23. psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David knew what he was talking about with shepherds. He was a shepherd. He was a shepherd, and he said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that leads me beside still waters and into green pastures and into the paths of righteousness. And even when I go through dark paths in the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to be afraid because I know that my good shepherd is with me. David wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that we could hear the heart of David, a man after God's own heart, even in his brokenness, even in his sin, even in his dark moments when he was despairing of his life and depressed, God spoke through David so that we can be encouraged and challenged by the Psalms that he wrote. God used David not just to be a great king of Israel, not just to be a great warrior that delivered Israel from their enemies, but to be the sweet psalmist of Israel that still speaks to our hearts today. We still sing his songs today. We still pray his prayers today. If you ever want to learn how to pray, you ever go, I don't know what to say to God, read through and pray the Psalms back to God because they're honest and they're gut level and they're, they're real. And it helps you to articulate some of the same things that David was feeling, some of the things that you might be feeling. So go to the Psalms and read some of the Psalms of the sweet Psalmist of Israel. And this is part of the reason we can see the heart of David in the Psalms, why, why David was called a man after his own heart. So God used David and one day was going to use his great, 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 great grandson to be the savior of the world. All right, let's get the worship team back up here and keep worshiping this morning. Good listening. Um, I kind of wanted to also bring up some announcements before we uh, get back into singing. Um, so uh, next weekend, well, actually, this weekend we were supposed to have a couple from Utah come and uh, speak, uh, Ben and Amanda, um, and they were going to kind of fill us in on how everything was going over there for uh, where the Lord is leading them, but they ended up getting COVID. So uh, they couldn't come this week. Um, it wasn't a good one. So now it's rescheduled. I remember the email, but uh, it was sometime in June.
June 3rd through the 11th, they'll be here. Um, most likely staying with Amanda. Yes. And so, uh, yeah. So if you ever want to crash Amanda's house during that week to pick their brains, it's a great time. And they'll come. I think they're going to come like and meet here from like four to six and just kind of fill us in on what God's doing there. Um, I think just super exciting stuff uh, is going on there. And so um, they want to kind of come and fill us in on that. So uh, that will be June 3rd through the 11th now. Um, and then that Sunday, they'll be here from like four to six uh, to speak. Uh, next weekend, we're going to have kind of a, I think we're calling it a family team meeting um, at from four to six on Sunday, uh, Sunday evening. Um, basically, we're just going to kind of roll through uh, what finances look like right now. And so, and we probably will sing a couple songs just to uh, lighten the mood. And then, uh, no, I'm just kidding. And then um, also just... Uh, see where like everything is going right now um, with impact and you know if if how this place is working out for us because you know it's crazy we've only been here for what four months four months and so um, how this uh, building is working out for us and uh, possibly who knows what next steps are and so um, we just wanted to kind of bring everybody together and kind of let everybody know and if people have questions they can bring it and so I would definitely pray and see what God has uh, on your heart and bring that to the next Sunday for that. Um, also, we have awesome ways to get involved. Uh, there are lots of small groups out there. Um, on Mondays, uh, there is the women's Bible study in the morning, and that starts at 9.30? 9. 9. Nine. See, I knew I was going to get it wrong, so that's why I'm pointing at everybody who knows it. Um, so nine o'clock in the morning for women, uh, child care is provided. And so the kids kind of go downstairs and the women dive deep. I think they're in Luke right now. Um, and so it's just a great way to get involved with some of the ladies around here. And then uh, at Monday night, um, Bill and Stacy are leading a Bible study, a little small group here, and that starts at 6.30. Yeah, I got that one right. So 6.30 um, here, and they're just, uh, what are you guys studying right now? I don't even know. I haven't. No, they're, they're kind of between things, so it's perfect time to get involved. So if you want to come here uh, at 6.30 and kind of just um, go with them, uh, it's a great small group. Um, and then also Wednesdays are our impact day, and also there's a family Bible study at Nathan and Amy's house. And when does that start? Starts at six, and uh, you can bring the whole family, and they're going through, I think, sermons, and just kind of digging more deep into uh, what God is doing in Matthew and on the Sermon of the Mount right now. And so, those are just some ways to get involved. Also, impact, um, impact our youth group ministry that we have on Wednesdays, uh, first through fifth. We're not meeting right now. Uh, we decided to just take a little break. Um, the team was kind of just weary, and so we needed uh, we needed just a little break. But no worries, we still have middle school people coming here. So <laughs> middle school is crazy. It's fun. That starts at six, and it goes to seven, and then we have high school group from seven thirty to um, I don't know. Usually it kind of lasts till like nine thirty, um, but um, it the cutoff is supposed to be eight thirty, but. The, ki the kids like to hang out here, and we, we play games and stuff like that. So, so yeah, so um, those are some of the things. Was it, Am I missing anything? No? I just wanted to make sure and throw that out there this morning. Uh, just great ways to get involved. Also, the cleaning team. Um, if you ever want to, like, just serve the Lord in that way, there's plenty of stuff to clean here now. You know, like our other building was super small, and we have this huge, ginormous space that God has provided, and it's just been amazing. And so um, we also need hands and feet there, too. So, yes, Richard. Yes, ladies' night, the next ladies' night. Um, the ladies are doing, like, a ladies' night every last week, uh, last Friday of the month, and this one is the 30th. Yes, 30th. And so the ladies just kind of come and gather and uh, talk about the Lord. It's a sweet time. It's kind of a break off from the if gathering a little bit, and so um, it's a great way to just have fellowship with um, the ladies around here. So, yeah, ladies, come and worship with them. And so, all right, I think that's all I got. Good stuff. Let's stand up and give it to God again.
today, God, I pray that uh, you would lead us um, into deeper waters, God, um, even when we want to drag our feet, even when we want to make it about ourselves, God, I pray that you get behind us and you push us into places that um, are out of our comfort zone, are out of our realms of comfort, God, I pray that you would make that leap for us and that, um, Help us to just walk along that path with you. Lead us to where you want us to go. Lead us where you want us to um, minister to in this community. And God, I pray that um, this community, there would be just a great revival here that um, people would just turn to you and that um, they would make you their Lord and Savior, God, and that um, they would know what your love feels like. Um, God, I pray uh, for Nathan as he comes up uh, with a message. God, I pray that we would have ears that are ready to hear and hearts that are open and ready to receive. God, um, I thank you for him. And God, uh, I pray that you would just speak through him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, this 
one doesn't go up, does it? <laughs> All right, we'll figure it out. All right. Well, I want to remind all of you, of course, that have been walking with us through this study in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that we've got to always remember the bigger picture of what Jesus is teaching his disciples. Um, He's teaching them about new heavenly kingdom values that are very, very different from the earthly kingdom values that we're used to and that we normally operate in. Uh, in fact, they're countercultural. They're, they're, a, they're a contrasting culture to the secular human society's values and practices. They're that different. They're almost upside down compared to the, uh, to the way that we operate. You know, Jesus said crazy things like, the first will be last and the last will be first. Uh, the humble will be exalted and the proud will be humble, you know. And uh, the poor will be made rich and the rich will, will find themselves in spiritual poverty. Um, blessed are those who are persecuted, not who live the good. They're the ones that are going to be honored. Um, so on and on it goes. They're just complete, completely different kingdom values. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you don't go to the head of the table. You sit at the foot of the table and you wash people's feet. You serve. So very different than our culture's values that we normally uh, operate in. See, Christianity has always been a countercultural movement, and that's no less true today. And when Jesus is teaching these new kingdom values, he's not just teaching personal. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, my faith is personal. I don't actually talk about it with others. I don't actually live it out too publicly. It's a very private, personal thing. That's not what God was teaching here. That's not what Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not an individual value system. It's not an individual lifestyle. Uh, But rather, he's talking about how we live in relationships, how we live in community, how we live with one another. Uh, See, Christian living actually involves relationships. Um, Christian community is, in essence, a family, the family of God, God's family, so that everything we believe and how we live actually flows out of of an awareness of God as our good father. We were talking about that over and over again. Jesus talks about God as our good and loving father, and that our fellow Christians, our fellow believers, are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And also, we're not to neglect how we're to think rightly and live among unbelievers, our unbelieving neighbors, uh, and how we're to respect them and love them those who do not believe in God and are outside the family of God, who we actually desire through our testimony and our witness to become part of the family of God. So all of it is in the context of relationships. This is why uh, forgiveness and um, um, all the ways that we are to interact and and care for one another um, come into play in Jesus' teaching. So here in Matthew chapter 7, by the way, chapter 7 is the last chapter of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Can you believe it? It feels like we've been in the Sermon on the Mount for months, and it's because we have. Um, So Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to think about and relate to our Heavenly Father, to our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church, uh, and also to our unbelieving neighbors who are outside the family of God. And so he begins with with our attitude towards our brothers and sisters in Christ with this first message here in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. So, chances are very high, whether you're a church-going person or whether you have have not done church much at all, that uh, you've heard this. Don't judge, right? Right? It's one of the most well-known and often quoted verses in the Bible today by people who don't even know anything about the Bible or what the Bible says or what the Bible teaches, but they quote this verse with authority. They're like, don't judge. Don't judge. And of course, what they mean by that, they say, look, hey, my life, uh, my relationships, my attitudes, my words, my choices are beyond your scrutiny, beyond your accountability, You don't have any right to tell me anything about how I'm living, right? So we play that card because, usually because they're not super confident about their lifestyle choices, right? But you can't ever say anything's wrong. Don't judge, right? We can't ever say anything's wrong. You aren't my judge, so 
Step back, right? Interesting, this word judge is the Greek word krino uh, that Jesus used here. It has a wide spectrum of meaning. It can mean to analyze, evaluate, or discern, or it can mean to condemn. And over and over again, in fact, many times in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has called us to analyze and to uh, evaluate and to discern both uh, what we're thinking and believing and how we're living and how other people are thinking and believing and how they're living. But uh, he has not commanded us as his disciples, as his children, to be judgmental and condemning. That's the other side of the spectrum, uh, judgmental and condemning. See, judgment for sin is God. Judgment for sin is God's responsibility alone. See, the disciple who takes it upon himself to be the judge of what another person does is actually playing God. Is actually usurping God as the just judge of all the earth. Um, for many people, Christians included, the very mention of God as judge is, makes people nervous and uncomfortable. We don't like to think of this aspect of God. We, we, we don't mind thinking of him as our good father who takes care of us, who meets our needs, who loves us. But when we start talking about God as judge, it makes us a little uncomfortable. Uh, Jesus has been over and over again talking about God as our good father. He delights in giving good gifts to his children and meeting their needs. But many people struggle with that end of the spectrum, that God is both judge and father. And that's a challenge for us because it feels like he has to be either or. Because he can't be both loving and just, right? Uh, but those of you who've had good earthly fathers, and I know that a lot of us haven't. And so this is, this is challenging to get our minds around God as father and to think rightly about this. Um, but those of you that have had a, 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 a healthy, emotionally and relationally and spiritually healthy father, um, understand that a good father can be both just and loving, both uh, righteous and fair and merciful and gracious, right? It's challenging, but, but it is possible. Uh, listen, listen to Hebrews 12 express this truth about this God as our Father and judge. Listen to this. My child, okay? Remember who he's talking about. He's talking to, to, to Christians, to those who have been adopted and brought into his family, through faith in Jesus. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Uh, don't lose heart when he corrects you. So it talks about a, a loving father who disciplines and corrects his children. And he, he disciplines each one he accepts as his child. As you endure his divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. So he's making judgment, but he's treating you as a loving father. In other words, bringing justice and judgment and discipline and punishment is what a good loving father does. Um, who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? He said that would be crazy. That wouldn't be loving. Uh, a father that just lets his children do whatever they want is not a good father and is not a loving father. Uh, who ever heard of a child who's never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you're actually not his children at all. And since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of our heavenly father and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us just for a few years, doing the best that they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us. Did you hear this? God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. You know what? I'm going to sit down here for a second. Sorry about that. All right. All right. So God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. That's the goal, by the way. Discipline is always helping us move into relationship with him, move into righteousness. Move. Remember, the good shepherd, what does he do? He leads us and guides us. That, that includes correction, by the way. When the sheep are going astray off the path, towards the briar patch or towards the cliff, he gently and lovingly corrects. We go, oh, that, that feels so restrictive. No, he's guiding us in paths of righteousness. He's leading us beside still waters and into good pastures. See, discipline, correction, is to, to guide us into what is good and best for our lives, right? And he's doing it for our good to make us uh, more like him, 
to guide us into paths of righteousness, to, to guide us into holiness, to, to, that we might share in his holiness. But no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. We don't really like it. Maybe we don't even understand what God is doing when he corrects us. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained uh, in this way. When we submit to God's loving discipline in our life, then there's a harvest of righteousness. God produces his good work in us, holiness, righteousness. We actually enjoy the benefits of, of, of the good shepherd leading us in good pastures. We have good food. We have still water. We're on paths of righteousness. Our lives are blessed. Our lives are protected by God's goodness. This is where God wants us. I mean, remember when Moses was putting it this way, he says, there's two paths of life. There's the path of destruction and death, and there's the path of life. He says, so choose life. Um, and, and God will correct us into that path for his glory and for our good. So God is both father and judge. Wrestle with that a little bit. That's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a hard thing to get our minds around. And think about this. For those that don't know God, this is a terrible reality. For those who aren't yet believers, haven't come to the place where they place their faith in Jesus Christ, this is a, a terrible reality because they've rejected God as judge uh, and he, they've rejected his rule over them, his, his sovereign rule. They've rejected it. And so they've not accepted him as their loving father. So the reality is one day they're going to encounter him as their judge. You know, they can act like he's not the just judge of all the earth all they want. They can, you know, run into the darkness, run away from God. But one day the Bible says that every one of us will stand before the just judge of all the earth and give an account. And so we can have him both as our loving good father who's made provision for our sin forgiveness, redemption, grace, for, uh, atonement, or we can encounter him as judge, right? For the Christian, their relationship with God as their good father has absolutely completely transformed their understanding uh, of, of him as their judge. In other words, because he's our father, we're no longer afraid of him as our judge. Think about that. Your father is wearing the robe and he's sitting behind the bench, and he winks at you and smiles at you from, from behind the, the, the judgment seat, right? We don't have to be afraid of him because he knows that we're in good standing with him, right? He is our good father, and he loves us. So the fear of condemnation has been removed. It's been replaced by loving correction, firm discipline, but it's for our good, and it leads us into paths of righteousness, and it leads us back to him, back to relationship. It reconciles us back with him when we go astray. He wants us in good relationship with him, and so he reconciles us back to him with his loving correction. So listen, Jesus knows that life in the family of God is not going to be perfect, okay? And so we're getting back to our attitude towards our brothers and sisters in the family. Uh, he knows that Christians are going to sin against each other. We're not perfect, you know? Some of us, some of you have those bumper stickers, you know, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. Okay, that's true. But the reality is that when we sin against each other, our sin is not personal and private. It always affects those around us, doesn't it? We may tell, tell ourselves a lie that this isn't affecting anybody. This little private personal sin is just mine, but it does. It's like dropping a pebble in the pond and the ripple effect just goes out and out. It affects those around us, right? So we're going to sin against each other, and that's going to create problems in our relationship. It's going to create tension. It's going to create conflict. So how do we show... Uh, a right relationship. How, what is the right kind of attitudes that we Christians should have when responding to our brothers and sisters who have sinned against us or are sinning against us? What we, how are we to respond when we see a brother or sister who's struggling with sin in our midst? And here Jesus says, we're not to be the judge. And this goes back to the word, not discernment, but condemnation, the judgmental condemnation, okay? Uh, this doesn't mean that we're not to make moral distinctions between truth and error, truth and lies, uh, right and wrong, good and evil. We're not to turn a blind eye to sin in the family. We're not to refuse to acknowledge it and, and sweep stuff under the rug. That's not what he's talking about. Jesus has called his followers to righteous, holy living uh, and, and to call sin, sin, and to hold our brothers and sisters accountable. But he also knows that this call for true righteousness and holiness among uh, his followers, and by the way, true holiness is versus the false, superficial, pseudo-holiness of the of the Pharisee, right? Um, that, that true righteousness, when he's called us to it, could, could actually breed, potentially breed, a critical, holier than, thou, holier than thou judgmental attitude towards our brothers and sisters. Um, and so those with this attitude tend to think of themselves as righteous, 
uh, tend to them th think of themselves of having the moral authority to look down their noses in an arrogant, condescending, condemning way at those that they think consider themselves inferior to them, right? Um, and they get so absorbed, even excited, that's terrible to say, in looking for and finding faults and sins in other people's lives that they become blind to the reality of sin in their own lives that oftentimes is far greater than the sin in the lives that they're picking out in other people's lives, uh, in their brothers' and sisters' lives. In fact, this pursuit of sin in other people's lives, which they often see the, the, the holier-than-thou righteous judgmental people see as, as proof that, that they are in right standing with God, is, uh, is like a plank of wood being compared to a speck of sawdust. And that's where it's going. Why don't we switch over to the next slide there, okay? Um, so this attitude often begins as a defense mechanism. This is really important to understand, okay? See, many times we're sensitive to the sin in our own lives, our own failure, our own sinfulness, but when challenged about it or when the Spirit convicts us of it or when somebody else might challenge us on it, we deflect onto other people, we pounce on the sin of others, we go, yeah, but look at her or look at him. I mean, you want to talk about sin, got an issue, right? Uh, and we pounce on the sins of others. And soon, that way of dealing with our own guilt by pointing out the sins of others becomes a habit, and then pretty soon it can become a way of life. Um, so why should we be careful not to have a critical, judgmental, condemning attitude towards our brothers and sisters? First of all, because it's, it's foolish. It really is. Why, why is it foolish? Well, Jesus taught that we should expect to be treated, uh, treated by others and by God in the same way that we've treated them. He says, judge not lest you be judged, for in the same way, why don't you go back to that one slide real quick, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and the measure you use will be measured to you. In other words, um, the same standard, if we judge other people harshly, we can expect harsh judgment from God. Uh, if we forgive others, as Jesus already said, we can expect to be forgiven by God. But if we judge them, then we can expect to be judges by, judged by God. If we show grace, we can expect to receive grace. The same measure that we use in our relationship with others is the one that God is going to use towards us. Harsh judgment of our brothers and sisters reveals that we don't really understand God's grace. They have, we haven't to totally internalized the grace of God in our own life and just how much we've been forgiven by God, right? Sinclair Ferguson said this, The heart that has tasted the Lord's grace and forgiveness has always will always be restrained in its judgment of others. Did you hear this? The heart that has tasted the Lord's grace and forgiveness will always be restrained in its judgment of others. Why? It has itself seen, uh, itself, it has seen itself as deserving of judgment and con condemnation before the Lord, and yet instead of experiencing his burning anger, anger and wrath and judgment, he's tasted his infinite mercy. And that becomes the basis for which we extend mercy and grace and forgiveness to others because we've received it from God for our own stuff, right? It's also, foolish, it's also foolish to judge our brother because no human being is qualified to judge our fellow human being. Paul said in Romans chapter 14, he says this, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Not, not your job. That's God's job. job. Who are you? Their own master will judge whether they stand or, or fall. And who is their master and who is the one who has the authority to judge? Only God. God is the just judge, not you. Um, and so it's so foolish to usurp God's authority and to try to play God in other people's lives and to judge their sinfulness, not our purview, not our job. So don't make judgments, Paul says, about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Usually we have stuff in our closet that we're trying to uh, downplay and diminish and trivialize by highlighting the sins of others, right? This is exactly, remember what the, what the Pharisees were doing when they brought the woman caught in adultery? Jesus, this woman, we caught her in the very act of adultery. And he says, every last one of you are adulterers. So if you want to be a total hypocrite and cast a stone and act like you're not an adulterer because I know that you've lusted after this woman in your heart, go ahead. And he pulled back the veil, exposed the darkness and the sinfulness in their own hearts, exposed the fact that they were feeling guilty about this very sin, and so they projected their sin onto this woman, and they slowly, one by one, dropped the stones and walked away because they realized, holy smokes, he saw, he knows me. They'd been exposed, right? And this is what Paul is saying. It's so foolish to try to judge 
something else because one day when you stand before the true judge, the real judge who has true authority to judge, he's going to pull back the veil and the darkest darkness that's in your heart and your motives are going to be revealed. And then who's going to be standing in confidence before the Lord on that day? See, only God can see people's hearts and assess their motives. And when we judge, we're arrogantly saying that we know their hearts and we can see their motives. Uh, and we play God in their lives. How arrogant, how foolish to do this. Uh, not only are we not the judge, but the reality is, the truth is, that we're among the judged. When we play judge, we're acting as if we're behind the bench and not on the stand. Right? We're in, we, if we enjoy posing as judges, we shouldn't be surprised when we find ourselves de- defendants in the courtroom rather than behind the bench as the judge. And that we're going to be judged by the same strict standards with which we use to, that we dare to judge other people in the family of God. As Paul put it in Romans 2, he says, You who pass judgment on someone else, you have no excuse. For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself. Or you who judge others, uh, because you who judge others do the very same things that you're condemning them of. Wow. God says, I see your hearts. You can't play play coy with me. Now, other people in the church may not see your hearts and your motives, but I do. And so he says, stop it. You're not qualified to judge. And you're not in any kind of moral authority position to be the judge. So it's foolish. Jesus' command to not judge is not only a call to turn a blind, blind eye to sin, but it's a call to be merciful. So he's not just saying, look, I don't want you to never, de- I don't want you to never deal with sin in the church. And just sweep it under the rug, hope that it goes away, and like, hey, I, I'm not their judge, you know. I know they're doing some crazy stuff, but who am I to judge? I'm in, I've got to deal with my own stuff before God. It's not necessarily that, but it's a call to be merciful and gracious towards our brother. Calling them to repentance and calling them back to right relationship with God. It's grace and mercy, not con- condemnation and judgment, okay? You get the difference? This is a different attitude, okay? In verses, okay, let's go to verses 3 to 5. So here in these, yeah, there we go. Thank you. In these couple verses, Jesus gives another reason not to have a critical, judgmental, condemning attitude towards our brothers and sisters. First of all, it's foolish because it's not our right. It's not our place. It's, it's silly to play God and to play judge. Okay, But here's another reason. Look, at Jesus says this in verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, here, let, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So here's another reason why we shouldn't judge, condemn, be judged, play judge, play God. It's because it, it, it brings out the hypocrisy in our own lives. We're not supposed to be hypocrites. Uh, earlier, Jesus had called out the hypocrites for doing good deeds to, in order to be seen by and praised by people. The whole reason that they were doing good things was not to glorify God, was not to love people. It was to get the praise of men. They were doing it all for a show. It wasn't, it wasn't because they loved God and loved others. It was because they loved the praise of men. And so he called them out on the hypocrisy. Uh, and now Jesus is calling out our hypocrisy by the, uh, by the way we find fault in our brothers and sisters. And, and, and the, the deal is here is that not just that we are calling sin in the lives of other people, but we're finding fault in them while failing to deal with our own major significant sins. Um, it's hypocritical. It's wrong for someone with significant sin in their own lives to presume to help someone else with their sin. Here, let me, let me, let me take care of this because you you, you're, you're obviously struggling. You've got some stuff going on in your life. Let me deal with that. And, and there's, there's this major disconnect because all the time I've got some major stuff going on in my life that I'm not dealing with and we project onto others and, and presume to try to take care of others when we've got sin issues or faults in our own life that we need to deal with. The illustration here that Jesus gives of someone struggling with the very delicate operation of, of trying to remove a speck. You ever done this? Try to remove a speck out of somebody's eye. You got to get the right light. They got to tilt their head back. You got to hold their eyelids open and you're really trying to, hey, turn, turn your eye to the left. I mean, it's pretty delicate, right? To, to find this tiny little speck of dirt from your friend's eye while, while you've got all the while, can you imagine doing that with a huge splinter in your own eye? I mean, Jesus is making, he's speaking in hyperbole here. He's going, this is, it's ludicrous for you to think that you could do this. Um, 
that, and, and this, this splinter or plank that is in your own eye is completely blocking your vision so that it's, it would be impossible for you to even see the speck, much less help them remove it from their eye. And he's saying, it's just silly. It's extreme. And he says, that's exactly what you're doing. When, you have, when you're being judgmental and fault-finding with the sin in your brother's or sister's life uh, and not dealing with your own sin. And so he's kind of making a funny here, but it's not really funny. People are kind of laughing like, ha, 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 because um, we realize, ouch, that, that's not so funny because the joke's on me. I'm the one on the brunt of that. I'm, I'm the dude with the, the plank in the eye. And so we realize, uh-oh, I'm in trouble here. Jesus says this is the ultimate tra- tragedy of hypocrisy, by the way. We've reached a place where we're actually play acting. Remember, that's what a hypocrite is. He's a play actor. Somebody who, who, he's an actor who plays a role, wears a mask, right? Uh, we're acting a part in order to hide from others and from ourselves the real nature of our own sin and guilt. We feel so guilty and we know we've got some issues, so instead of dealing with it, we put on a mask and we pl- try to play God in other people's lives. And that's the ultimate tragedy. We've confused this acting now with reality. We've actually deluded ourselves. We've come to believe the lie that we really are better than others, that we really are spiritual, that we really are righteous, that we really are better off than our brother and sister. And so we look, so this, this fault finding, this speck searching comes out of a place of arrogance and, and um, a holier than now judgmental attitude, a religious superiority. Um, and so instead of softening our hearts when our sin is exposed, we put on a mask, we get defensive, we start finding faults in others, and it begins to harden our own hearts, even blind our minds and our hearts to our own sin. We don't even realize that we've got this plank in our eye. We're too busy focusing on the specks in other people's eyes. So this way, when we do this, when we play this game, the false righteousness of the Pharisee or the hypocrite, we can experience the pleasure of self-righteousness without the pain of repentance. The best of both worlds, right? I can convince myself that I'm right with God and never have to repent, right? And Jesus is calling us out on that saying, are you kidding me? So there are two powerful examples of this kind of hypocrisy in the Bible where someone tries to exalt themselves and declare themselves righteous by comparing themselves with somebody who they don't think is as righteous as they are and judging others. The first is in Luke chapter 18. You remember this story? Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. Righteous, right? We're to hear the best of the best, the righteous, the the creme de la creme of of the the righteous people, the, the religious leaders in Israel. The other was a despised tax collector, the bottom of the barrel, the worst of the worst. Oh, this is going to be good, right? Jesus tells this story. The Pharisee stands by himself in the temple and prays this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters and sinners and adulterers, and certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I I know you know this, but I just want to remind you, Lord that I fast twice a week and I give a tithe of everything that I possess. You're lucky to have me on, my t- on, on your team. But the tax collector didn't even come into the temple. He's standing at a distance, probably out in the court of the Gentiles, probably at the gate. Doesn't even feel like he, he is worthy to come in the courtyard. Doesn't even look up to heaven. Dared not uh, even lift his eyes to heaven as he prays. Instead, he beats on his chest in sorrow and says, Oh God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this sinner, the tax collector, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, the the Pharisee thought that he was righteous and in a position of moral authority where he could find specks in others' eyes and did so on a daily basis. And Jesus said, not only are you not in a position to find fault in others, but you are not even right with God. You've got your own issues going on. Um, And then there's another story. Remember, we we alluded to this this morning. David. David gives us an example of this kind of hypocrisy. In 2 Samuel 12, David uh, found himself lusting after a woman from his rooftop, Bathsheba. So he went and found her and brought her to his house. He committed adultery with her. Then he tried to cover it up. And when that didn't work, he had her husband killed. Then he took her and made her his wife instead. He thought he'd gotten away with it, but the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David a story. Listen to the story that Nathan told David. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. 
the rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle and owned nothing but one little lamb that he had bought. And he raised that lamb and it grew up with his children and it ate from the man's own plate and it drank from his own cup and he cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. And one day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flocks and herds, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David, how do you think David responded? David was furious. He's projecting now. He is furious. How dare he? Right? As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, the man that does this is going to die. The man that has done this is going to die. Deserves to die. Sounds pretty self-righteous, right? He's taking a moral position. He's pointing out the speck in this man's eye. Who could do such a thing? He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one that he stole and for having no pity. Nathan turned to David and said, you are the man. This is what you have done. Can you imagine David in that moment? (gasps) The veil had been pulled back. The skeletons in his closet revealed his own sinfulness, the darkness of his own heart, his hidden motives, his lust, his pride, his covetousness, his lying and deception, his murder, on and on. See, judgmental hypocrisy often manifests itself in flying into a rage against some injustice or sin in another person's life. And it's not matched by the same righteous indignation and anger in dealing with our own sin. It's projecting onto others my own stuff, right? Uh, Angry outbursts can be the expressions of a heart that hasn't truly understood the grace and mercy of God and is in therefore no position to be gracious and merciful towards others. Instead of this response, Jesus says, if we truly want to help our brothers and sisters, we've got to first humble ourselves and deal honestly with our own sinful hearts. Stand under right God's righteous judgment. Let the light of God's truth and justice shine on the dark places of our soul. Only then will we be able to see clearly and respond graciously with the sins of others and the failures of others. Not until our own sins have been dealt with, brought under the blood, brought, under, brought into the light, and dealt with honestly before God. Paul in Galatians 6 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone's caught in a sin, he's talking about in the family, okay? This is brothers and sisters. If someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, who are filled by the Spirit, truly spiritual, should restore that person gently, humbly, meekly, and watching your own selves and your own lives because you're going to be tempted. Okay? Carry each other's burdens. Okay, this is mercy, grace, love. This is love for my brother, not a self-righteous indignation. How dare they bring this sin into the family of God? This is love and mercy and grace because there by the grace of God go I. Right? Right? And so we bear one another's burdens, and this way we'll fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that there's something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Right? All right. Now we move on to our attitude towards scoffers. So we've got our attitude towards brothers and sisters. Who are the scoffers? Well, Jesus uses some strong language here, right? So he doesn't only warn against a critical judgmental attitude towards our brothers and sisters. There's also a danger of swinging the pendulum to the other extreme, and losing all discernment, all discrimination whatsoever, right? Not able to say, and that's where our culture is, by the way, not able to say that anything is right or wrong. Not able to say that anything is good or evil. Uh, our culture, not only does our culture say you can't say that something's right or wrong or good or evil or, or, or truth, uh, but they would argue that it even exists, that right and wrong don't even exist, that truth and lies don't even exist. It's just... Everything's relative. If it's true for you, that's fine. If it's right for you, that's fine. If it's, if it's wrong for you, that's fine. But just don't project your, your truth onto me. No truth is objective. There's no outside of us standard of morality, standard of righteousness, of holiness, of truth, of good and evil, to which we, our lives will be held account. No, they say, no, that's not true. And, of course, that makes us all feel better about ourselves because then we can go, nothing I ever really do is wrong. I just keep moving the line till I feel comfortable And then I don't have to worry about being held accountable. But that's not what Jesus is saying. We're not to lose all discernment. We we need to be able to call sin, sin, to declare right and wrong, good and evil, truth and lies. Paul was regularly engaging with unbelievers in dialogue, 
in conversation, sharing with them the good news of the gospel. And he was regularly asking for prayer that he would have wisdom to know what to say uh, and how to approach unbelievers who don't think how we think, who do not share our values, who do not embrace Jesus' new kingdom values that he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul encouraged the believers to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. We need to think discerningly, discriminatingly about the way we engage and the things that we say and the way we approach unbelievers. So um, what is actually our responsibility to our unbelieving nature, neighbors? Anybody? What is our responsibility? What, how are we to, to respond to our unbelieving neighbors? What, what is our responsibility to them? What, what do you got, Braden? Yeah, we're supposed to out and, and go and communicate them with them the love and truth and grace, the good news that we have, the hope that we have in Jesus, right? We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. That's what love of neighbor means. Love of neighbor doesn't mean I just circle up with those in the family and we do this little holy huddle and, and uh, we let people die and go to hell all around us and don't bat an eye at it. No, we have an, uh, we have a, we've been commissioned by Jesus to take the good news, the hope that has so transformed our lives to the lost and broken world around us. So we can't just hunker in a bunker and wait till Jesus comes. We have a mission. We have a mandate to go and tell the good news. Um, but we need to be wise and discerning. This is, the, by the way, this is the mission of the church, just in case that doesn't ring a bell for you. That's the mission of the church. Everyone in the world has created in the image of God and called by God into his family, is invited by God into his family. Uh, and so we're to go out with the good news of the gospel and urge people to repent of their sin and believe the gospel and be, come into relationship with God as father and be transformed and be, be brought into his family. But here's the reality. Here's the truth. When we do that, when we go out on mission, and by the way, the mission of the church is not to get everybody to come to church, although we'd love for our whole community to come to church, but really the responsibility is for us to be missionaries is to go and tell. It's not just to come and see, come and see and come hear the preacher tell you about Jesus, but we're all to be missionaries. We're all to be evangelists. We're all to be witnesses sharing the good news. You have access to people that will never darken the door of this church that I may never have access to. You have relationships, you have family members, friends, co-workers, and that's your responsibility. God has placed you in the family, in the neighborhood, in the workplace, in the sphere of influence that you have for a reason. Uh, you've got eight to 15 people on the front row of your life that they're your mission field, and you have a responsibility to share with them the hope that you have in Jesus, all right? But here's the reality. Here's the hard reality, the difficult reality. Um, not everyone responds well to being told that they're sinners in need of a Savior. Not everyone likes to hear that. Not everyone's comfortable with hearing that. Uh, according to Proverbs, there's, uh, this is one of the distinctions between a wise person and a fool. It says, don't correct a scoffer or he will hate you. Correct a wise man and he will love you. So scoffers hate to hear truth and correction. Wise people listen and respond with open hearts uh, to God's truth. So we need to be, as Christians, wise and discerning in our conversations with unbelievers, in our relationships with unbelievers. Uh, to know whether God's truth will be heard or whether it will elicit nothing but abuse and profanity. So when Jesus says this, it sounds really harsh. Look, listen to what Jesus says. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Who are the dogs and pigs that Jesus is talking about? Listen, do dogs are not the cute little cuddly domesticated pets that you see somebody, some people carrying in their baby carriers into the grocery stores, right? And feeding out of their mouth. They put little bits in the mouth and oh, let, their, let their dog eat out of their mouth. That's not what he's talking about here. Um, these, aren't the, these aren't the cute little cuddly pets that you invite to live in your homes and to play with your kids and let your kids, oh, lick, lick the baby, kiss the dog. Okay, uh, these, these in, in Jesus' day, these were packs of dogs that were running around the streets, wild packs of dogs that were scavengers, um, they were vicious, they were dangerous, and they were savage when they were looking for food, and they would attack people, and they were dangerous and to be avoided. So obviously Jesus isn't referring to dogs as in canines, he's referring to people. And he's talking about evil, wicked, hard-hearted people who despise 
the truth of God. They've rejected the truth of God. They've rejected the rule of God. They don't want to hear it. They hate it. Okay? They despise it. Um, and so when they hear the gospel or the truths of Scripture, they hate it, and they will turn on you with a viciousness and a hatred and an animosity and a hostility. Some of you have experienced this on Facebook, right? Or maybe in real life, okay? Um, they're so disgusted with that which is sacred. They don't even like anything to be called sacred. They're so disgusted with that which is sacred that they turn on the giver of the good news, the giver of the truth, and they will tear you to pieces, Jesus says. And their goal is to destroy both the message and sometimes the messenger as well. Ruin your lives. People are out to ruin uh, people who take seriously their faith and want to faithfully share it with others. People will, are wanting to destroy their lives. Uh, pigs in the Bible were always unclean, unholy, uh, abominable animals. They're never spoken of positively in the Bible. And if dogs attack the messenger, then pigs trample the message. Pigs don't recognize the beauty and value and holiness of the gospel of the kingdom of, of heaven. Instead of seeing it as the pearl of great price for which they should go and sell everything they have in order to obtain it, they give it no value. They, they, they trample it under their feet. They drag it through the mud. They not only reject it, but they seek to destroy it and trample it and denigrate it. And so Jesus told his disciples to be sensitive to that kind of response to the gospel. Remember when he told his disciples as he sent them out to share the good news, preach the gospel in all the villages, he says, go into a town and they won't hear you and they respond like dogs and pigs and they reject you and they hate you and they uh, abuse you and like, like they often did to Jesus, tried to throw him off a cliff or stone him. Shake the dust off your feet and go to a town where they'll listen. That's what he said. You've got to be sensitive. We're not to force the gospel on those who are not only not receptive, but hostile to the things of God and to our witness. See, hard-hearted cynics and scoffers, they're not going to be willing to listen to you. They want to argue with you. They want to shout you down. They want to, they want to mock you. They want to harm you and your reputation. So Jesus instructed his disciples to move on and to seek receptive ears and soft hearts. You could sit there and bang your head on their hard hearts for a long time, or you could go where there's fertile ground and sow some seed. What's a better use of your time? So we need to learn some spiritual discernment from Jesus. So how do we recognize these kinds of people? By their response to the gospel. As we're sharing our faith with them, they don't see its worth. And if you press them any further, you'll discover their deep hostility and hatred erupting in, in anger and opposition and even persecution. Okay? It's a sign that maybe you should back off and let the Spirit of God do His thing there. And you go on and share with more, more receptive ears and hearts. See, one of the lessons we need to learn from Jesus is to live with the cost of our message being rejected. Some of us hate that. We can't imagine, Right? We feel like if I just do it in the right way and if I smile a lot and if I'm winsome and if I really tell them how much I love them, then surely they'll understand that my motives are sincere and pure and that I'm doing this out of love for them and surely they'll, they'll listen and respond. No, no, they won't. Jesus was, was the best gospel presenter on the face of the planet. And how did they treat him? He was despised. He was rejected. He was hated in his own hometown. He was literally, they tried to push him off a cliff. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They stopped their ears and they ran on him and, in a rage and wanted to kill him. And eventually they did. So if Jesus, the most winsome, kind, gracious, loving, gentle proclaimer of the gospel ever was hated and despised and rejected, do you, how do you think you're going to fare any better? There's hearted, hearted people in this world that sadly, will not respond to the gospel, right? And it's heartbreaking, isn't it? We want everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But Jesus told his disciples it would happen, so we shouldn't be surprised when people adamantly reject the gospel. And so we aren't to, to mindlessly, insensitively keep forcing the gospel on people who hard-heartedly reject it. And sometimes we as Christians just aren't very discerning. We're not very wise. We're not very reasonable in this area. Um, we fail to see that the language we use, maybe the methodologies that we use to communicate the gospel are no longer appropriate or effective. 30 years ago, when I was growing up in the church, I was trained to do door-to-door -door evangelism. 
literally to, to go just in a neighborhood. We'd drive people to a neighborhood, drop us off, and literally go from door to door, pounding on the, on the, on the doors. And they'd open the door, and, you know, first thing out of my mouth, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven, be with Jesus? Um, most of the time, uh, I got the door slammed in my face. Um, sometimes people go, uh, you know, and, and have some kind of answer. Sometimes I got, but in, in the years of doing that, I, there were very few that I actually got to sit down with them and share the good news of the gospel. Most of them. And today, with COVID and with the state of politics and religion, and you, you saw the stats, I think I mentioned this last week, that for the first time in the history of the United States since the poll was back, its first poll was taken back in 1930, uh, we are below 50%. It's always been above 70% that uh, consider themselves religious in our country. We're below 50%. We're at like 45% in our nation. And that is dropping precipitously. So not only are people not, they don't consider themselves religious, but they're, they're not super open. They'll say things like, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. But that's really a cop out to just to quit, for you to quit your presentation. And so... Um, there's a hostility on a level today. And, and so we, for us to think that we should still do, you know, the little, we, they taught us to hand out tracks, you know, little tracks, and most of those just end up in the very second after you put that in somebody's hand, it's on the ground or it's in the trash can. Um, not that somebody doesn't find one of those on occasion and read it, um, but just some of the methodologies. We used to make, they used to teach us to make balloon animals for kids, balloon animals and sing really corny Christian songs. And, and, and that was an effective way to do child evangelism back in the day. Today, kids look at you and like going, what are you doing? And, and of course, you know, parents are teaching kids that you stay away from creepy dudes that make balloon animals. <laughs> so we gotta, we got to think through this. We need to be discerning. We need to, we need to be. The, the, the message of the gospel is always relevant, right? But we have to be sensitive to the people that we're trying to reach. We have to be emotionally intelligent, aware of their emotions, and aware of what they're going on, use discernment. Um, or they might come to the conclusion that the gospel is outdated and ir- irrelevant to their lives, right? Um, but the message of the gospel always is relevant. But the way that we approach and engage people often turn them away and, and harden their hearts to the gospel, Okay. So we need to be discerning in our attitudes and our relationships with unbelievers, okay? We cannot judge in advance who or who will not receive or reject the gospel. Only God knows their hearts. So we offer the good news to all without discrimination. We sow seeds broadly, okay? But when it is responded or rejected with hostility, even Jesus said this, when you sow seeds, there's going to be hard hearts where the, where the gospel doesn't take root. It's snatched away by the enemy before it can even take root. There's stony ground. There's thorny ground. These don't bear fruit. They, they don't bear spiritual fruit. It's only a small percentage of the ground that is soft and good soil that, that they can receive and bear fruit, okay? And so Jesus said this, and we need to be aware of that. So we offer the good news to all. Um, we realize that many will reject. The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many are on it. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are on it, Okay? Um, so we realize that many will reject and we move on to others who will listen and believe and hear. Look for open, receptive hearts. But it is our mission to go and tell. And uh, the bearing of the fruit, the, the fruit of the gospel is God's responsibility. We, we can't save anybody. We can share the good news. We can sow seed and we trust that God will take responsibility for the bearing of the fruit, okay? But we are not to be judgmental and condemning of those people, those dogs, those pigs. No. No. We love them. We look at them with, with, with grace and mercy and forgiveness, with compassion. Every time Jesus looked at the Israel that had hardened their hearts against his proclamation of the good news, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers its chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You were so hard-hearted that I have to turn from my people, the Jews, and, and now offer the gospel to people who were willing to listen, the Gentiles. We're to be not judgmental, but discerning. Interesting here, by the way, just to note, Jesus took five verses to warn against a judgmental, condemning attitude, the holier-than-thou brother, and only one verse to talk about a lack of discernment in our relationship with unbelievers. So it's obvious where Jesus felt the greater uh, danger lies. The bigger problem in the church is not us being discerning in our relationships with unbelievers, but the bigger problem is our judgmental, condemning attitude towards our brothers and sisters, okay? 
Lastly, let's, let's conclude with our attitude toward our Heavenly Father. Oh, boy. I turned to, turned to Mia on the way to church this morning, and I said, uh-oh. I think it's going to be a long one today. But we're almost done. Okay, this is the last relationship. So we got the relationship with our brothers. We got our relationship with, with unbelievers. We got our attitude toward our Heavenly Father here. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be open. Some of you in Impact are humming right now, right? You're singing this song, right? Um, see, if we're to live in humility, in grace, and, 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 and forgiveness towards our brothers and sisters, and we're to discern how to live among and engage in redemptive, healthy conversations with our unbelieving neighbors, then we, have, then we, then we desperately need our Father's provision of grace and wisdom and counsel in order to show the Father's love in our relationship with others. So really, our relationships towards our brothers and towards the lost people in the world around us are really centered in our view of our Heavenly Father, our attitude towards Him, right? We're to persist in asking for God's gracious provision as though we are needy beggars desperately in need of His provision. And we can come to Him and ask and seek and knock with confidence. Why? Because we know that the one who we're asking and seeking and knocking uh, responds to us. He responds to our asking, and he reveals himself to our seeking, and he opens his heart to, the, to those who are knocking. And, and this one is our good, good father. This is the one who responds to our prayers. He's our good father. Remember, so we can pray as children of God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? This is one of the most astounding promises in all the Bible, that the God of the Bible is the true and living God who hears and answers our prayers. So Jesus says, ask and you'll receive. Here's what John Piper says. He says, when you pause to consider that God is infinitely strong and can do everything that he pleases, that he's infinitely righteous so that he only does what is right, and and that he's infinitely good so that everything he does is perfectly good, and that he's infinitely wise so that he always knows perfectly what is right and good, and that he's infinitely loving so that in all of his strength and righteousness and goodness and wisdom, he raises the eternal joy of his loved ones as high as it can be raised. When you pause to consider this, then the lavish invitation of God to ask him for good things with the promise that he will answer and he will give them is unimaginably wonderful, right? We're asking not somebody who can't deliver. We're asking somebody who can deliver in abundance, right? My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory, abundantly above what we ask or even need. So prayer puts our weakness in touch with God's strength. It puts our lack in touch with God's abundant supply. It puts our confusion in touch with His wisdom. It puts our hurt in touch with His grace and comfort. It puts our sin in touch with His forgiveness and grace and our poverty in touch with His riches. This is the God of the how much more, right? I want you to go to the next verse here real quick. We're not quite there yet, but I want you to see that this is the God of the how much more, right? So in asking, we we come to our Father in humility we need to be submitted to his will. Okay, this is a key. We don't just get to ask for the, hey, if I've got a good father, I'm going to do like my kids ask for me. Dad, can I have dessert for dinner tonight, right? Um, can I stay up all night? Um, the key to getting what we're asking for is to ask in accordance with his will, right? We come to our father in humility. We submit to his will. Even Jesus did this with his own father. Remember how he ended his request? Oh God, I'm not so sure. My father, I'm not looking forward to the cross. If there's any other way we can accomplish your saving purposes, I'm all for it. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So he ended his request with a submission to the will of his father. And 1 John 5, 14 and 15 gives us the key to answered prayer. This is confidence that we have toward God, toward our Father, that if we ask anything, here we go, that's awesome, asking anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, again, according to his will, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. So we get to ask, but again, we want to ask things that are in align with God's good purposes for our lives. He gives it good, good gifts to his children in accordance with his will. And that's the key to answered prayer. We seek, why? Because God is not this distant, far-off God. He's, we don't have to search high and low to find a God. It's not, he's not a God of far-off. He's a God who is near. This God is not distant. He's not unknowable. He's not unapproachable. 
Deuteronomy 4 says, Seek the Lord and you will find him if you search after him with all of your heart and all of your soul. He says, Call unto me and I will answer you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. We don't have to search high and low. This is a God who wants to be found. He's like your child. We've talked this before. When, when Madeline used to play hide and seek with me, she would hide in play sight. And if I didn't find her five seconds after I was done counting, she says, I'm over here. Because it was not about being lost. It was about being found. And so when we seek after our God, he's hiding in plain sight. He wants to be found by us and he wants us to, to call to him and, and he will answer us and seek him and he will be found. And then when we knock, this knocking suggests persistence, right? It's not just, uh, no one's home. I'm, I, I knocked once and no one came to the door. I'm going to bolt. No, we keep on knocking. Jesus is teaching his disciples about prayer, and he used this story. So he goes, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, and you want to borrow three loaves of bread, and you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit. So you're at midnight, right? We had somebody, I want to be careful like this, but we had somebody last night in the middle of the night, one of our neighbors fired up a chainsaw. We're like, really? Who's cutting down a tree at 9 o'clock at night? Now, I know they're not in bed, but I was in bed, because I, I thought about firing up a chainsaw at like 4.30 this morning when I got up. But I decided to get... <laughs> I decided against that because that would not be loving. We're back to the judgmental. Okay, so, but this friend comes to the neighbor at midnight. It's midnight. So where is he at midnight, hopefully? He's in bed, right? Uh, he comes to him at midnight. He says, look, I've got a guest who's just arrived and I have nothing for him to eat. And, and so the guy's going to call, my neighbor's going to call up from his bedroom. Don't bother me. The door's locked for the night. My family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. He just got his kids to sleep. And back in the day, this was the family bed, right? So they're probably, his little ones are sleeping right next to him. If I get up, I'm going to wake them up. I'm like, leave me alone. We're asleep. Go away. I tell you this, uh, he won't do it for your friendship's sake, but if you keep knocking long enough, he's going to get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so Jesus says, so I tell you, keep on asking. Uh, and, and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. This is Luke, by the way. For everyone who asks, receive, and everyone who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be open. This is not, by the way, I want to say this really quickly. This is not because God's the guy in the bed who's going, go away, leave me alone. God is not a reluctant God who is, is preoccupied with other things and hasn't, doesn't have time to bother with your petty needs. No, this is the God of the how much more. He's going, if your neighbor will get up and give you bread, how much more will your good Father in heaven, who delights giving good gifts to you, how, how much more will he not lavish the blessings of all of heaven upon you? So he's not saying, hey, I, this, God's the neighbor that you've got to wake up in the middle of the night and cajole him, like, look, I'm really sorry to bother you again. I just, ah, I know this is a bad time for you, Lord, but, you know, if you could, you know. No, this is the God of the how much more. He's like, oh, I'm so glad that you came. Here, here you go. What do you need? I have my supply at your... Okay, and then which of you who uh, is a father, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Who would do that? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake? If you see your father in, uh, your child in need of food, would play games with him like this. So if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven good gifts to those, give good gifts to those who ask him? See, even earthly parents, he's saying are preoccupied, self-centered. Sometimes uh, we have an innate impulse to do uh, what is best for our children, even when we are selfish and self-absorbed and, and preoccupied. We still want to give good gifts to our children. So he's saying, who would do this? What kind of parent would do this? And he basically said, no, no good parent ever would do this. No loving parent would cruelly trick or harm their children in this way. So he says, if you, sinful, selfish, not always loving, not always kind, wouldn't trick or harm your children, but would always do what is best for them, how much more, how much more your Father in heaven will give good gifts to those who ask him? So, again, why does Jesus emphasize the fatherhood of God here again? For many of us, that, that's not a good image. He'd just been talking about God as the just judge of all the earth, and we should never lose sight of the fact that one day we will stand before him as our judge, and on that day the question will be, who's going to pay for your sin? And what will the punishment be? And there's two, only, only two options at that point. Either I'm going to take the rap for my own sins, or I'm going to find a substitute, someone who take the punishment for me. And Jesus is the one who stepped up and said, I will take your punishment for you. I will die the death that you deserve. I will take the penalty of your sins so that you may be forgiven and go free. 
Those are the two choices. So you either let Jesus pay for your sins or you choose to pay for your sins yourself. That's the day of judgment when we stand before Jesus as God as judge. But the incredible truth of the gospel is that that judge that we're going to be standing before at the end of the day, the just judge of the earth, because of Jesus' death in our place for our sins, instead of condemning us to eternity in hell, he comes down from the bench, he gets off the judgment seat, comes down from the bench, he signs adoption papers. And he wraps us in his arms of love. And he says, my son, my daughter, I want to share with you my home. I want to share with you the eternal inheritance of all my riches and all my blessings. You're going to be my son. You're going to be my daughter. Come with me. Be part of my family. And ask me what you need. And anything you need. What an incredible thing. So this is, this is how we can think rightly about God as our father. The just judge of all the earth is our father. He's our Abba, our daddy. Well, I just want to conclude with this. Jesus had just finished teaching his disciples how to pray. Not what to pray, remember? How to pray. Uh, And we're to pray that our Father's kingdom will come and that his will 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 be done in our lives and in the lives of the people of the world around us. And the reasons that our prayers aren't answered, this sounds like great, man. We can ask and we can seek and we can knock and God's going to give us anything we need, anything we want. The reason sometimes that our prayers aren't answered is the Bible tells us that we are praying selfishly for our own purposes, for our own lusts, and for our own self-interest, and for, to build our own kingdom and not God's. Um, the key to answered prayer is, prayer is a praying in accordance with God's good will. Um, and when we don't share God's perspective on what is truly good for us, and we ask for things that are not going to be good for us, then he says, no, no, I'm not going to do that for you. I want what is best for you. So this relationship, this standing of our relationship with our Heavenly Father forms the basis for our right thinking and our right relating to others in life. And next week, we're going to have to pick up here next week about our attitude towards others because we're going to get into the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Um, That flows out of our right relationship with God and our right relationship with our brothers and sisters in the family and our right attitude towards those in the world. Then we're able to see them as God sees them and we're able to love them as God loves them and do to them uh, the way God would treat us and not as we would selfishly or sinfully treat, treat them. So we'll get into that a little bit more next week. Let's, let's, let's close in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for this important teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, these are Jesus' words, and help us remember that, that you've communicated us to us this, 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 these important truths about how to live in right relationship with you and, and with our brothers and sisters and with, with people in the world. And you've called us to put our self aside, our selfishness aside, and to love each other with, with an everlasting love. You've called us to love you as Father and to love one another as brothers and sisters and to love the lost as you do. And so help us to remember today that our relationships are based on the law of love. As you have loved us, you've called us to love one another. Help us to be obedient to that. We ask that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we're going to just close with a song here real quick, and then we'll let you, we'll let you go. Yeah, we've got a, another new song for you. Um, I can't really think of a better song after that message. Um, it is a song of surrender. It is a song of just... Um, in desperation for God and realigning ourselves with him and having him um, breathe in with us and have us walk along his path. And so um, if you don't know it, you, you can just listen. Uh, we sang it at uh, the last few um, winter blasts. It's so good to just surrender your life because you're desperate for them and just to follow him. And so, um, yeah. Uh, listen or or sing along with us but it's super powerful and so just sing it out
that prayer and that attitude is totally different than looking down our noses in judgment on the people around us, isn't it? It's, it's saying, oh God, I want you to have your way in me. I want you to search my heart. I want you to deal with my sin. I want you to have your way in me. Then and only then will I be able to right, think rightly about you and rightly about my brothers and sisters and rightly about people in this world. So it starts with me, right? It starts with our own hearts. It starts right here. See, when we come to put our faith in Jesus, it affects all of our relationships, but it starts right here. It starts with us. So ask God to do a work in you today and watch what God's going to do as he transforms not only your heart, but also your relationships. All right, God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. We'll see you next week.